So for me, I wear these earrings whenever I'm on an interview or I'm working with clients or helping people, I wear these earrings. And then when it's time to go be a parent, I take them off. So that's kind of like my ritual. Yes. I'm like, okay, now I'm taking off the stresses of work, kind of close my laptop and go into the other room because I do work from home. And then I'm mom and then I'm there for my children for whatever they need. I'm kind of milling around. Sometimes they want to talk to me. Sometimes they don't, but I'm always available. You're listening to Entrepreneur Journeys, where I share insights and strategies based on owning and managing businesses while traveling and living on three continents. I also interview business owners about their journey, what they learned along the way, and how that can help you with your business growth. For more resources to accelerate your entrepreneur journey, head over to gapologist.com, where I share resources, events, community, and more. I'm your host, Joe Matz. Let's get started. Hello, hello, and welcome to Entrepreneur Journeys. Today, I have with us a very special guest, and she helps married couples juggle the demands of marriage, family life, and business so they can experience the highest levels of joy and success while leaving a legacy they can be proud of. Monica Tanner, welcome to the show. Yay, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And for our listeners, now, Monica, where do you hail from today? Uh, I am originally from Dallas, Texas, but I have lived for the last 22 years with my family in Boise, Idaho. Oh, okay. Very good. And, um, man, is, is that... Um, Boise, Idaho. I think of, I, I'm probably thinking wrong, but I think of old abandoned uh, miners' towns and sagebrush running through abandoned towns. Am, am I way off bounds here? No, not at all. Most people actually think of potatoes. That's what I thought when I first came to Idaho. Um, but no, I mean, we have a, a big city. Um, I wish I knew numbers. I think I don't know, 300,000 or something. Um, but it's a great, great city, wonderful place to raise your kids, very family oriented, um, beautiful mountains and lakes all around. So I loved raising my family here. Okay. And my impression is from the movies and old cowboy westerns, things like that. So I, I didn't mean to say it's all abandoned miners' towns no. today. No worries. <laughs> great. And now, where did we meet? I do forget that. That's a great question. I actually have no idea. It's but the, I'm glad we met. I'm glad we met. It's the magic of networking. And it, it, it was some time ago. So I'm, I am glad you're on the show today. Well, I am too. <laughs> so, so one of the things we'd like to talk about is your journey. Yeah. Was there any indication when you were in middle school or high school or before college that you were going to be a business owner? You know, that's really interesting because my original college major was business. I actually got into the University of Texas at Austin's business program, which is really difficult to do. I didn't realize uh, I, I think I was very entrepreneurial in high school, just out of necessity. Uh, I had to pay for all my own things and I played sports. And so I had to get really creative because I couldn't work while I was, you know, in season. And so what I used to do was create t-shirts and sell them, you know, to all of the student body. And, you know, I was dating a baseball player. So I made really cool baseball fan shirts and things like that. And I'd always, you know, add a little bit for you know, to, so that I made a bit a, of a profit, a so little profit, learned, of course. <laughs> yeah. So I learned how to crunch numbers and figure out my overhead and, you know, all of that. So, uh, yeah, I went into college thinking I wanted to do business and ended up dropping out of that program into sociology and child development because I wanted to learn. I just, I took a sociology class and it was the most interesting class I'd ever taken. And so I loved the group behavior aspect of things. Um, and so I think all of that really set me up for what I wanted to do, but I didn't realize that I was going to marry an entrepreneur. We would start a business together and then I would have my own business and then we'd be running two businesses out of the same household. And I think, man, I probably could have learned some more in that business program that would have been really helpful. But, you know, like everything we learn on the job, 
you know, we, we, when we know better, we do better. And that's the best way I think to learn anyways. Oh so. yeah. Oh yeah. I think many times we're, we're dealing with the compass more than a map and we kind of look at the compass and it points in a direction. We're like, we're going there. And, and we find out all the trials and tribulations and joys, successes, failures, and, and learning along the way. Yeah. And I remember when I was leaving the business school, everyone was like, are you sure it's really hard to get into? You won't be able to get back into it. And I was like, I am so sure. <laughs> oh, you left so, before graduating. Oh, yes. Yes. So okay. I ended up graduating with a sociology major and not a business major. I see. Um, so I, I, w I wanted to get my MSW, not my... Uh, oh, what's it called? A, a BA, you... Business Administration, yeah, a BS sure. and BA... Yeah, yeah. And what yeah. is the MSW? Uh, a Master's of Social Work. So I, I, okay. I have always wanted to do counseling. I've always wanted to work with couples and families. And so I actually was going to get my MSW right after college, but I met my Prince Charming. I moved to where he was going to school and I didn't actually even get into that program just for prerequisites. I didn't have enough prerequisites. And I thought, oh, I'll just take those online. I'll get in next year. And then I started having babies and growing my family. So I, I ended up going back to school after my fourth child went to school full time. So. Okay. So you would you, would you consider yourself a, a mompreneur? Is that, is that how they pronounce it? A hundred percent. I'm absolutely a mom for a wife first, then a mom and then an entrepreneur. Oh, now that's interesting how you put the priority in wife, mother, entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I teach people that your priority should always be on your marriage first and then on your children. A lot of people get that backwards. Yes, yes. It's very often I hear mother first and they identify as being a mother um, and then a, then a wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. But you've got to take care of the relationship that formed that family because yes, you, you are a wife first. And if you do it right, right, I mean, you're always a mother, but your kids are going to grow up and, and leave and then you're left with your spouse. And so if you haven't been prioritizing them the whole time, you're in a heap of trouble. Right. And then you're, it, it's your spouse. And then that's, that's why you get cats or dogs or some people get <laughs> rabbits, ferrets, <laughs> anything like that. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not the biggest animal person. So I way, I highly prefer people to animals. <laughs> Okay. I, I go back and forth depending on the day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. Yeah. So when, so now you're, you have a business with your husband mm -hmm. and how, how did that go? How was that journey? Yeah. yeah. So I graduated from college first and we got married. He had two years left but we worked for a company that allowed us after he graduated to start our own kind of um, branch of that company. Okay. And that's what we've been doing for the last 21 years. So I was learning while my husband was going to school and finishing up school how to do all the back end office stuff. And then we ended up moving here to Boise where he was raised and started a, a residential and commercial pest control business, which we've been running in the in this area for 21 years. So in the beginning, I was a big part of it. I did all of the office work and the bookkeeping and all of that. And then I just kept having babies. So after my third baby, I remember I was like nursing a baby and trying to meet the payroll deadline and trying to figure out we had an office here and an office in Texas. And there was all these really complicated things about payroll in Texas and that were not in Idaho. Hmm. And so I'm like nursing, but n trying to meet these deadlines. And I just had a breakdown. And my husband came home and I said, you can either check me into the funny farm or you can hire somebody to do this because I can't do it all. I'm like going crazy. And he was like, OK, I know exactly what to do. <laughs> And so that next day we had a bookkeeper come in and an accountant and all the things. And so then I was no longer, you know, trying to manage these huge deadlines and these small children that needed me. So for a little while I did the stay at home mom thing, but I realized I am an entrepreneur at heart. Like I need my own thing to mm -hmm. kind of excel at. And so I started a really um, like a small business with one of my best friends where we made homemade things like she made hair bows and I made signs with vinyl on them and we put together this seasonal boutique so when my husband wasn't super busy with his business 
we would, you know, rent out homes and things like that and put together this big event and it grew to be really big. And when my kids all went to school, it was something I could do while my kids were home and things like that. It wasn't too intrusive. And then I ended up selling it and doing what I really, what was in my heart, what I've always wanted to do, which is help couples and families kind of manage. So I've done entrepreneurship from you know, my husband and I owned a business together and then I pulled myself out of that business and then I've had my own business. So I kind of know all of the different stresses mm -hmm. and strains that entrepreneurship puts on a marriage, which there's a lot. There's a lot. Yes. Yeah, there is. I had a business with my first wife and it, we hired someone. We had a, we had a property where we had an office separate from the house on the property and mm -hmm. we tried to keep things separate. So the house was family. We could yeah. walk across the yard and there was our business building where business took place. That's a great way to do it. And that was good. And I, I've maintained that throughout throughout because it was really good. Um, when I had just one house and I was single and I had an office and I had a living room and a bedroom, bedroom kitchen, you know, your normal regular house, right? Mm -hmm. And I took one of the bedrooms, made an office and I put music in there that was different from the music in the living room. So that when I left the office, I changed not only the physical ambience, but the audio ambience also. That's a great, I teach all the time. I teach my, my people that they should have rituals when they go from boss mode to parent mode to lover mode. And I think that's really important. So I like how you used music to kind of help you do that because I think what happens is a lot of times we spill over the stresses of work yes. to our family, you know, we're irritated with the kids and things like that. And then, you know, then we don't get our good couple time after that. And so it's really important. So for me, I wear these earrings whenever I'm on an interview or I'm working with clients or helping people, I wear these earrings. And then when it's time to go be a parent, I take them off. So that's kind of like my ritual. Yes. I'm like, okay, now I'm taking off the stresses of work, I kind of close my laptop and go into the other room because I do work from home. And then I'm mom and then I'm there for my children for whatever they need. I'm kind of milling around. Sometimes they want to talk to me, sometimes they don't, but I'm always available. And then I have a separate ritual, like a way of changing out of mommy mode and into lover mode, because I think that my spouse really deserves to have my undivided attention as well. So mm. I think those rituals are really important. That is so important. And we are just beginning this interview, and that is a big takeaway to separate. your. It's always a part of your personality. It's always there. It's a part of your life, but it doesn't need to follow you, yes. right? Right. Absolutely. We, we do the same today. My, my wife is next door. She works from home 100%, as do I. And we, we have our own separate offices. Mm -hmm. We don't, uh, we're, not, we're, we're not 100%. We don't do it 100%. We will talk about business because we exchange mm -hmm. ideas. We brainstorm with each other. Yeah. We, we talk about what's going on. But, it's, yeah. but not in a, hmm, it's, it's how, I don't know. I'm not even sure how to say this, Monica, but it's not in a, business type way it's it's more of a, of a water cooler talk or you know maybe you, know, you have a word really interesting too because that's another thing that i i really teach and speak about a lot that's really important is having these um separate keep it, having sacred spaces is what i call it mm. so you know my husband doesn't get i'm not in my husband's business anymore like i don't know the day-to-day -day or anything that's happening there but I do appreciate when he talks to me about things that are stressing him out or, you know, this problem with dif different employees and things like that. So I like to be, you know, a sounding board for him. I like to feel like the co-pilot, like to know where the business is going and how he's experiencing his day to day. And the same goes for him. He's not passionate about relationships. He doesn't love to be on my social media. You know, he's he's a good sport about it. He does let me post lots of pictures of him, but um, you know, he's not going to come on an interview with me or anything like that. He's not in the day to day to, of my business, but I, he is a brilliant businessman. And so, I, you know, I ask him all the time things about finances and should I be, you know, making this payment or whatever. Um, and so I appreciate that he's there for me. And then I can also share with him my wins and mm. when things don't go the way I want. But 
I call that like a sacred space. So there's times to talk about those things, but there's also, we call it daily connections where we're talking to each other and it has nothing to do. We do not bring up the children. We do not bring up business or finances Mm. or anything stressful. That's 20 minutes every day. So I say every couple can find 20 minutes to connect. That's not, these are like um, stress relieving conversations. It's like getting to know each other's inner worlds. Mm. And if there, if if you if you do the math on it, there's one thousand four hundred and forty minutes in a day. So I say twenty of twenty minutes should be dedicated to just getting to know your partner as a person, yeah. not a business person, not a parent, like a person. Like, as what are you thinking person. about during the day? Right? What are you learning about? Is there somebody that you t- you talked to today that you learned something from? What's stressing you out? What's making you excited? What can I do to make your life easier? Those are the types of questions you can ask yourself, ask each other, I'm sorry, in those daily connections. And then in addition to that, I talk about how important date night is. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be at night. It can be in the morning or in the afternoon, but three hours every single week. So same thing. If you want to crunch some numbers, a hundred, everybody there's the cool thing about time. It doesn't matter how much money you make or how strong you are or how many friends you have or, you know, any of that, everybody gets the exact same 168 hours in the day. And so in the week, week. and so it's, in a week, right? And so you choose how you're going to spend that time. And so I always say you have to make sacred three hours to spend together. And that's doing something that you enjoy. Either you enjoy it, your spouse enjoys it, something you enjoy together, but you're having fun, you're laughing, you're flirting with each other, you're making memories, you're getting out of the humdrum of the routine of life. And you're making, you know, those memories that these are the types of things that you're going to think about when you're sitting on the swing and you're old and you're watching your grandkids play in the yard. It's like those times that you spent together and it's not the big elaborate stuff. It's the small, simple things done week by week by week. So if you put that together 20 minutes a day and three hours a week, that's less than 3% of your time but it's going to give you a massive return on investment. It's, it's so important. And I'd like to, to touch on one thing you say about a date night. So what qualifies as a date night? And let me explain. So, you know, often my wife and I will have lunch together. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we we sometimes we go weeks where, where we don't have lunch together. We might do it once a week. And that's this is Monday to Friday. Weekends mm-hmm. is for us. Um, so that's not a date if we're having lunch together in front of the TV. But sometimes we talk. Um, we also go on walks with the dogs. We've got two dogs. And that's a great time for daily connection. It is a great time. I mean, that's that's one of the best things about the walks. But we love sitting on the porch also. And we might have a glass of wine and the dogs are out there and neighbors come by and we talk with neighbors. And sometimes it gets so late we're eating dinner at 9 o'clock at night. Would you like to get in front of more of your ideal clients and at the same time, build your brand and create evergreen content? Well, you can do that with podcast guesting. This very moment, you're listening to a podcast that may have been published today or three weeks ago or three years ago. In a very real sense, you're engaging with the speakers, hopefully enjoying yourself and learning something new at the same time. And you're getting to know the guests and how they help their clients, their customers, and the problems that they solve. You may even be their ideal client and want to learn more about them and download one of their free resources you can find in the show notes or maybe even become a client of theirs. See, when you're a guest on a podcast, you will enjoy that same kind of engagement. It is perhaps the easiest, most cost-effective way to get in front of new audiences. Learn how you can be a guest on the right podcast and engage with your ideal clients with the free resources available at gapologist.com. Is that a date? If we're on the porch, let's say. That is a great question. Honestly, in all the years I've been doing it, I have never been asked that question exactly like this before. So I've never had to think about that answer. But let me tell you what comes to mind. I would say the definition of a date is an agreed upon time 
between the two of you that you are doing something fun and memorable. Now, I think it changes over your lifespan. So when you're having young kids, you've got to be creative about how to get away from the kids. So a date would be defined as a time that you're spending away from the children, you know, getting to know each other, doing something fun, just enjoying each other's company. It doesn't have to be expensive. It can be a long walk. My, my favorite date that I, that my husband and I do is we go in and get a treat, like a drink somewhere or um, a, a cookie or something. And we go for a walk around, along what in Boise is called the green belt. Okay. And so we just walk and we talk and we enjoy our, our, our treat and it's just a time for connecting and it costs us very, very little, but it's at least three hours that we are away from our children and our children are older now. So we don't need babysitters, but we do have to like do some advanced planning because we have to make sure that so-and-so has a ride home from this. And, you know, these people aren't hanging out at our house without supervision or like, you know, so we right. do have to do some managing around it, but it's something that we've, I mean, it's not, this is not perfect. It doesn't always have to be planned in advance, but I do encourage people to plan it in advance. That way you're not pulling out of the driveway and going, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? What do you want to eat? I don't know. What do you want to eat? And then you're like grumpy the whole time, right? So I like to say plan it in advance and then you can take advantage of all of the anticipation. You can send texts throughout the week. I'm so excited for our bike ride this weekend, or I cannot wait mm. to try this new restaurant with you or whatever it is. It's not anything it doesn't have to be specific. It's just something that bonds you together, that creates memories where you can learn about each other as humans, not business owners or parents or, you know, all the other stressful things. The idea is this, and I'm working on a podcast episode all about this right now. So I, it kind of goes into answering Super. your question, like, what is the definition of a date? It's because what I see a lot of, a lot, there's a lot of divorce happening around me. And what's interesting to me is these aren't divorces of like young couples who are like, we just couldn't get along or, you know, the seven year itch or, you know, there's lots of different reasons people get divorced. But what I'm noticing more of today than I haven't ever seen in the past is older couples that have been married for a very long time deciding to divorce. So they call it this, this phenomenon of gray divorce. And what I think happens, like my own theory about it, is that life is difficult. Like people get to the point where they think like, this isn't like what I wanted, or this is how, how I thought that life was going to go. Or they just get so involved in the day-to-day -day of life, which is raising kids and paying bills and building a business and like doing all these things that their spouse becomes not exciting to them anymore. And so you're at the gym mm. or you're, you know, getting a smoothie at your favorite smoothie place and somebody pays attention to you and the newness of that or whatever, it doesn't even have to be a person, just a thing that breaks you out of this humdrum routine that people get into in their lives. And it's like sparks this, maybe there's more to life than just this marriage that I haven't invested enough time into. And so the way I say, like the single most thing I think that you can do to guard against this complacency or this boredom or this roommate syndrome or resentment, like all of the things that build up in a marriage over time is to make sure that you're always dating. If you think right. about dating when you were young, when you were getting to know each other, this person was new. They were exciting. You like hung on their every word. You, It was like so fun to get to know this new person and have like all of the greatness of who you are reflected back to you, right? And we don't, that doesn't ever have to end. I mean, I'm a completely different person than my husband was dating 22 years ago. Mm. I've had four children. I've built lots of businesses. I've had some heartache, like all kinds of things have happened to me on a day-to-day -day basis. But if my husband just felt like I've been married to this person for 21 years, nothing ever changes. She thinks the same way as she's always thought. If I do this, she's going to do that then of course it would be so boring to be married to me. Of course. But we go out like it was the first time every single weekend. We're like so excited to talk to each other about the week. What are you reading? What are you 
it, what are you like loving right now? Like, who are you? Who is this awesome person that I'm married with? We make memories. We have fun. We laugh at each other's jokes. We flirt like silly teenagers. And that keeps our marriage fun mm. and exciting and growing and progressing. And we're always get learning new things about each other. Yes. And, so, you know, everyone that's is, the point of date night. <laughs> everyone is, is evolving. We're all on our own journey. And, and I'm on a journey, my individual journey, but I'm also on a journey with my wife. Mm -hmm. As yeah, my kids are grown, they, they live 5,000 miles away. They're in Italy, you know, so we, we don't have children right here close by. And we talk, we learn about each other because we're, we're evolving. We're different. The, the woman I spoke with last year is very different. And sometimes we talk about things that happened 20 years ago. It's like, I didn't know you did that. You know, we've been yes. together so long. You keep in secret. Not, no, no. Yeah. It's just yeah, there exactly. are things, you know, the well is deep. If you're mm -hmm. interested in the other person, there's always and, things to learn. And it's a choice to show interest in the person that you're married like yes. you can always be like, I know this person. We sleep in the same bed. We eat at the same table. That we're everything's the same, right? You can decide to feel that way, or you can be really interested in that person. So like, if I know. if you've yeah. lost interest, mm -hmm. now how do you get it back? Mm, great question. You're, these are like really different, awesome, great questions. I love that. Well, I think first you just decide decide to be interested in the person you're married like ask them what their favorite color is ask them what they're reading ask them who they enjoy talking to ask them what their dreams and goals are for the future like plan something together that you can work towards together ask them what like hobbies or sports or 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 uh you know, music or things that interest them that maybe you had no idea like learn something new together take a class like a dancing class or a cooking class or a uh i was gonna say herbology class like whatever <laughs> whatever like, right whatever it is right <laughs> like, like get interested in the yeah. person and that is really just a choice right like we can do that with our children too like i mean i see my kids every single day but you know, I ask them questions about like how they're growing, who they're becoming. And if you see your partner as a new, awesome, fun human as well, like then all the rest of it just comes, you know, comes. do something to spark your interest in that person. Mm. Yeah. So asking, being interested. So it's almost like acting as if you were interested, you become interested. Is that Right. Can oh, I... yeah. Like I, I, I would never have said it that way, but yeah, absolutely. Because you know, if... it's kind of what music do you listen to in the car when you're alone? Right. You know, I don't know. I mean, I'm pretty sure my husband listens to country, but like, you know, it's just like, <laughs> it's like get really interested. Like try to channel that energy that you had when you were young and like so enamored with this person that you couldn't wait until they called you or you know, they open the door and you're just blown away every time. Like, why can't you be like that now? Yeah, it, it takes effort. I've always heard that marriage takes effort. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if, if it seems effortless, does that mean it's, it's going right or you're just not paying attention? <laughs> Uh, most of the time, I think it's that you're not paying attention. <laughs> uh -oh. That brings up another point is like, be willing to disagree. Yes. Be willing to bring in something other, uh, you know, some different preference or difference of opinion or, you know, be willing to try new things that you're not good at, you know, like, like, um, uh, you know, when you're dating, you're like up for anything. Right. So. I think sometimes we think that we've been married for a long time. You're like, no, I'm definitely not going to try that. Like mountain biking, that sounds horrible, right? No so, way. I love mountain biking. Right, right. <laughs> and so like I could My jump mind. on a mountain bike. Like I, the first time I did it, I got a flat tire and ended up walking the whole course. But my <laughs> husband was like, thank you for doing it. You oh, know, great. like, sure. Like, like channel that back when you were getting to know each other up for anything energy because everybody has access to that you just kind of have right. to decide you have to do it you know one thing we did we we've done a lot of new things recently but you know one thing we did was these meal kits that you can buy and have them shipped to your house and they're 
you know, they'll send you an onion and two carrots and a zucchini and um, a yeah. pack, you know, eight ounces of beef. And, and you put it together and you cook together. And that's that's been a great thing. We love the cooking together like that. That's so fun. And if you don't yeah. have kids at home, why not cook naked together? I mean, that's fun and exciting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting There's a little out of my comfort zone here. Spice it up. <laughs> oh, that's funny. We also bought a camper recently. And this, if anyone's been following me, you know, we, we bought a teardrop camper. And we're, we're going to spend, I think it's like 16 days this year camping. Well, I bet you and your wife, no matter how long you've been married, will get to know each other in a whole new way through that. And that will be so fun. Yeah. It is fun. And that's part of the excitement is, is getting out of our usual routine. Now, mm -hmm. my sister, I talked about my, my sister and the camper, and she's like, I can't do that. I can't. I, no tents, no campers. I go to hotels. And I said, well, you're, yeah. there are campers and there are hotelers. Yeah. <laughs> right? Um, yeah. But she'll go out for a day, for two days, three days with her husband, and they'll get a hotel. And sometimes mm -hmm. they travel far. Sometimes they don't travel far at all. Just yeah. getting road trips are a great way road to get trips. to know each other. Um, I, so this is just comes from my own experience. My husband and I, when we very first were like, you know, falling in love, we took a cross country road trip in the middle of August. It was so hot in his truck that had no air conditioning and no radio. So I'm like, if you really want to get to know each other on a new level, try something like that. Like just no radio, no air conditioning, you know, take a long road trip and see what happens. Right. Or switch places for a day. Like, I know that's super fun. Like I'll, my husband will be like, you want to go to the office? I'll be like, sure. And so on a day when it's not like, you know, a whole lot going on or something, I'll go to his office and he'll, you know do some of the things that I do during the day. And so it's just fun. It's just like, try something different. I always say like, if you feel like you're in the humdrum of everyday life, just do something weird to change things up. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it takes, I mean, for, for me, it's normal. I've, I've lived on three continents. You know, I've, I've had many businesses. I speak three languages. For, I've been in countries where I don't speak the language and I learn the language. I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, which was way out of my comfort zone. But I think for a lot of people, it, it's very difficult to get out. And I, I can't identify with that. Like if someone mm -hmm. came to me and said, I like to sit home, it's watching the TV. I don't know how to get active and do things. I'd be like, I, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one thing my husband and I actually talk about a lot is understanding other people's perspectives, right? It's just like such a different, like you should try it someday, like sit on the couch and just do nothing and see how that goes for you, hmm. right? You might learn a lot about yourself. So, you know, there's always fun things you can do to kind of make your life feel different. Yes. Yes, there are. Even even as, as little as taking a different route to work. Mm-hmm. Or take totally. or ride your bike to work. Ride your bike. Of, take an Uber. Do something different. Yeah, yeah totally. absolutely. Order from a, a totally different restaurant. Like it just depends on the level of, of of routine that you you know enjoy. Just try something different. Well, we're fortunate here in Raleigh. We have all kinds of of ethnic restaurants, and every once in a while we'll go to a South American restaurant or an African restaurant or Middle Eastern restaurant just to to do something different. I love that and learn about that culture. Like you could tack on like a learn about whatever type food that you're trying, you know, mm. like I've had people um, print out maps of the city and then, you know, try to eat in a different like location or there's all different oh, I like like, that. Really cool, fun things. Yeah. You can like put pins in it. Like every time a new restaurant, you know, be the first one to go try it or whatever. There's like all just really all kinds of fun. I I'm creative that way. That's my, one of my favorite things to do is to plan dates for other people. So in my membership, actually one of the, the things that I do is I create dates for my members and there's like a top level tier date, which is like go to a hotel like or a spa or, you know, like 
a high price, there's a mid-range date, cheap date, and a free date option. So you always have options because you can do just as cool of things absolutely for free. You just have to use your imagination. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I, I go back to camping. There are campsites. Before we had the camper, we would go to a campsite, and it was $15. $15 yeah. for the night at a campsite. And I know that's not a lot of people that they're not, they're going to say, no, 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 no. But it was so exciting. And if you're saying no, 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 Monica might advise you to say, yes, 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 yes. Try something different. Uh, tr you can try anything once, right? Any if you hate it, you hate it. It's fine. <laughs> Just mark that off the list. Right, right. We're, we're fortunate here. We also have, um, we have DPAC, which is a, an, a performing arts center. And they bring in off Broadway shows, shows that were on Broadway, you know, and, and now they're they're traveling around and they'll stay here for three weeks or something. They are fantastic. That's we great. went to one show, um, The King and I, years ago, and we still there's a there was a phrase in the show that we still use between us, and it's just every time we use it, it's we don't laugh out loud anymore, but it's kind of cute. It's kind of nice, you know. It's it reminds us of that time that we had and then the enjoyment that we had in watching that show. You bring up another point that is one of my favorite things to teach on, and which is creating your relationship culture. And that is, it does come from those memories that you create like that. So my husband and I have like our own language. And I mm. always, you know, suggest that my couples do this. Like, for example, when our kids, when all four of our kids were young, they used to do this thing where they'd look up at us and say, hold you like meaning hold me, but they would say, hold you. Right. And so that's like <laughs> part of our history. We used to think it was so cool, but now to this day, I mean, we have kids that have left the house now. Right. But it's like part of our language, my husband and I shared language. So it's like, I've had a really hard day and I just need to, like, I just need to be held. Like I just need a hug or I just need someone to say everything's okay. Right. And he'll walk in and I say, hold you. And he knows exactly mm. what that means. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Just hold me. Yes. <laughs> but it's like our language. And we have other tons of things like that. Just like you said, a line out of a show, uh, the w the way we fight sometimes. It's, it's from a country song. We call it the Texas tornado, right? And then, <laughs> you know, when we make up, it's we do the two-step. Like it's our own right. language. It's our own culture that we've created in our own relationship. I don't expect anyone else to understand it or to have the same meaning behind it. It's just for us. It's just for you, right? Thing. It's something that you share that no one else shares. Yes. And it it has meaning because it's just the two of you, because it's based on experience. And, and then I go and share it to all your listeners and all the things. But yes. <laughs> well, they they'll they'll keep it secret. My listeners, they know how to keep secrets. <laughs> Yes, for sure. So important. So creating, so we should recap some of the things we talked about. Let's so do that. Sacred spaces. So, you know, making sure that you, there is definitely a time and place to talk about business and schedule the things for the kids and do all of those, have your budgeting meeting. Those are really important, but creating sacred spaces that are just for you. So through daily connections and through um, date night. And then making sure that you're minding your transitions when you're in boss mode, when you're in parent mode, when you're in lover mode, those things are really important. And then creating that relationship culture, so important. Like those three things will safeguard your marriage against any challenge you're gonna come up against. That's awesome. Now, tell me about your, your community. Yeah, so I have a community of mostly entrepreneurs, but other married couples as well. And it's called the Passionate Marriage Club. And it is for couples who understand that, you know, you have to keep learning, keep growing, progress, progressing, stay interested in each other. Date night is really important. And so I teach a principle every month. Uh, I call them my laws of connection. And eventually that's going to be my book title. Mm. But um, so it, it's just, it's very simple. It's very affordable. It's the opportunity to network with other entrepreneurs who are, you know, have the same values where marriage and family are very important as well as growing their business. So we have a lot of, lot of fun in there. Yeah. We'll have links to that in the show notes. Yeah. yeah thank great. You. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I, I looked at that and I also looked at your free quiz that you have. 
Yeah. Right? And I think that's just the intimacy level of your marriage. So it's good to know, are you, you know, are you keeping it hot and heavy? Are you also minding the emotional intimacy or has your marriage kind of grown cold a little bit and whatever the case, it's okay. Nothing's gone wrong, but it's important to keep building that emotional, physical and sexual intimacy because it's all so important. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's all tied together and it's all part of having Oh, gosh, I hate to say an effective marriage, a happy marriage, a joyful marriage, a marriage that supports the individual and the couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I call that a, having a passionate marriage. A but passionate yes. marriage. Yes. 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 And passionate doesn't necessarily mean sex, right? No, not at all. You, it means you're passionate. I mean, you're passionate about your podcast, I'm sure. Yes. Yes. I'm passionate about sitting on the porch with my wife. It's a very simple thing, but it's exactly, wonderful. Exactly, but it keeps you alive and it brings you pleasure and yes. it's important to you. And that's what passionate having a passionate marriage is. That's great. And on that note, we're going to get to a section that I like to call the lightning round. Let's go. Okay, here's a couple of questions for you. How has your entrepreneurial journey transformed you? Oh my gosh, everything. It has taught me so much about probably not being in control and learning the things that I could control versus the things that I can't. And what I've learned about it, that is actually my first law of connection, which is that the only thing I have any control over, we think we have control over lots of things, right? But the only thing we have control over is ourselves, yes. our thoughts, our actions, our the things that we say, the things that we do, the things that we eat, those things we can control, right? But I can't control my husband and what he thinks and does, or my children, or my dogs, or the weather, or the economy, or anything like that, that I think we get really confused. And the most disappointed people I've ever met in my life are the people that try to control the things that are outside of their Oh control. my gosh, that sounds like a prison to me. <laughs> <laughs> what most surprised you as a business owner? Oh man, that I could get really good at my craft, but it doesn't matter if I don't know how to market it. That <laughs> was very surprising. Very, very important. Yes. Okay. What unexpected challenges have you had to overcome? I think most of it have had to do with learning how to market my business. So I've, it, it's surprising that I've had to spend just as much time marketing as I have training myself in marriage. So, uh, you know, like I said, you can know all the things about marriage and be the best marriage coach on the planet and have the best things to say. But if you don't know how to market it, it really doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. You have to get out there. You have to be seen and you have to be heard. And there are many ways to do that today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. So there are lots of options. So that's good. Yes. What book has made a big impact on you and who would you recommend it to? Oh, anything by Brene Brown. She's brilliant. Yes. I'm really into Terry Real right now. Um, and I would recommend it to anyone who just wants to live happy, thriving, you know, uh, passionate lives. Yeah. What What is the name of the second author? You got Brene Brown and Brene Brown. Ter Terrence Real is his name, Terrence and his Real. book that I just read is called Us, and it was really, really good. That's uh, That's more for couples. I would recommend that for anyone who wants to really have a, a, a deep meaningful relationship. Okay. And what advice would you give to an aspiring entrepreneur in your industry? Don't give up. The world needs what you have to offer. There's going to be pivoting. There's going to be pitfalls. There's going to be all kinds of, you're going to learn, you're going to grow, you're going to be very disappointed at times. But don't give up. I think that the I think that the advice that has stuck with me the best and has really helped me is to stick around long enough to get noticed. Mm. So this was especially talking about my podcast. So I have a podcast that's about six years old. It's called Secrets of Happily Ever After. And my mentor who was helping me start the podcast was like, listen, nobody discovers a great show in the first season, right? Like all the great shows, the iconic shows that you just binge watch now, like Friends and Office and all of those great shows. Nobody was watching them in the first season. It was like, 
somebody discovered them in the third season and then everyone went back and binged it, right? right? So he's like, don't worry so much. Everybody sucks at the beginning, but you got to stick around long enough to get noticed. And that's what I tell myself all the time. Yes, yes, it's getting started because you're not going to be good. Well, you could be good, but you're not going to be great. You're not going to be fantastic, right. awesome, excellent in the beginning. But six months from now or 18 months or 24, 36 months from now, you will be. But if you wait... 36 months to get started, you're still going to be starting at the beginning. So get started. Yeah. You've got to be willing to have that beginning time. Yes. Right? Yes. Step out of your comfort zone. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Monica, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your wisdom and knowledge with my audience. Absolutely. Anytime. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd love to have you back. Maybe we'll touch base again, um, Get have you on the show um, in the future. That would be awesome. Thank you. Very good. And let's recap again, just um, the f what you have going on, where our, our audience can learn more about you and what you do. Yeah, thank you so much for asking. It, the easiest place to find me is my website is just my name, monicatanner.com. And there you can find my podcast, Secrets of Happily Ever After, where I share weekly tips and tricks on how to juggle the demands of marriage, family life, and entrepreneurship. Uh, I also have all of my programs free and paid, lots of ways that you can work with me and follow me on social media for all my silly dancing, funny things that I like to talk about. <laughs> Super. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you for listening to Entrepreneur Journeys. Remember to subscribe so you catch all the episodes and check out the show notes for any free giveaways or gifts that were mentioned during this show. Entrepreneur Journeys is brought to you by Apexable, providing the insights, tools, and transformative structures to help you reach your business summit. I'm your show host, Joe Matz, and until next time, I hope your journey is filled with breathtaking views and successful outcomes.